All right. So, uh, Darren, so way back when, uh, 10th Muse actually started out in a uh, kind of a production house inside of Image. How has it kind of changed since you've brought it uh, into Tidal Wave? So it changed a lot because it used to be this number when it launched at number six. Now you add four or five zeros after that. And that's how big of a number that it is now. So the sales numbers changed a lot from the time, you know, being an independent, it's a lot less down the food chain than it would be at Image Comics, which we did sell. I think it was, yeah, as I said, it was the sixth highest selling comic book when we launched it for the month of November. If it wasn't for Battle Chasers, we would have been number five. Um, but we are, we will soon check because we are launching a new 10th Muse series. Um, I believe in November so with the new number one and I'm super excited about it the art is amazing and all that stuff I think I shared some of it with you off the record yes yes so, I haven't shared it with anybody I, I won't do, but so. I won't <laughs> so how are you able to still find an audience uh with 10th Muse you know I think there's the core fans I think luckily Back in, I think it was like 2001 when we launched it, um, or 2000, sorry. Um, it, as I said, it did really well. It had a fan base. It became one of these, like, because back in then it was like about the, the strong female characters. You know, you had she, you had um, Evangeline, you had like all these, like Glory, you had all these different female characters. And she kind of fell in at the, the tail end of it. But then we also had Rena Miro, who was Sable the, from the WWE, um, you know, be our photo model. So that was a trend back then, too. There was like Alley Cat and um, other celebrities like China was doing comic books. But what we did is we did something different is we put we made sure that the artwork was like top notch. We hired people from Top Cow to do it. But then we also hired Marv Wolfman, you know, who, um, you know, did Teen Titans, Creative Blade created Nightwing. And so um, we hired him to do it. So whether you liked Sable or not, you would really like this book. So that's one of the things that we've kind to try to do. And I think people really ended up liking the character. And so she's kind of stood the test of time. And so I think, you know, anytime we release something, she still has a popularity factor to it. Why did uh, Tidal Wave, I guess, kind of pivot to the biographical comics uh, with, you know, <laughs> Because we went from you know, this, <laughs> we went from six to whatever, six to 60,000, whatever it is. So um, it was really that, you know, we noticed that the numbers were kind of going lower. We were still with Diamond at the time. And um, they just kept going lower and lower and lower into the hundreds, you know, for different books. Like Vincent Price Presents, I think, was selling like four or 500 copies at Diamond at the time. And the book was a solid book. Um, and then, you know, we had to do something to stay relevant. So I think the first biography book that we did, you know, was in 2008. And we started off with Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin. And whether you liked either one of them, you had to really kind of respect them from a female empowerment angle, because the series is called Female Force. And um, we did it just about their accomplishments. We really didn't like take shots or be negative or anything like that, because we wanted it more about female empowerment. And those just like took off. And this was at the time when um, IDW was doing uh, Barack Obama and John McCain comic books. So we thought, you know, we've always done strong female characters like Judo Girl, 10th Muse, Isis. So why not do maybe something bio biographical? And um, my background was in entertainment, working for like e entertainment television, you know, USA Networks and Lionsgate. So I thought, let's try doing this. You know, I, I, I get the power of celebrity and personalities and stuff. So we did it. And as I said, the books were probably our biggest sellers, you know, since back of the days at Image. So it kind of like shifted the way that we're actually going to do stuff. And so we still, we became known as like the biography company because then we did our first celebrity comic book on, um, I believe it was Michael Jackson. We did a tribute on him. And that book took off. So, you know, one of the things when I was a kid, I used to collect 
People Magazine, not People Magazine. Yeah, I collected People Magazine, Us Magazine. I had every TV guide for like a six year, and then I had a move. So I was like, oh, those are gone. So I had TV guides and I collected anything celebrity wise. And I was always, I lived in an area in California where they filmed everything. So the entertainment industry for me was just like white hot. And so I would always collect, you know, pinup books and that type of stuff. I was into Teen Beat Magazine. So I thought, you know, why don't we start doing people like at the time, Justin Bieber or Taylor Swift and for the fans. And so that's how those started taking off. And then we just started doing political books and those had a world of their own. So it's been a lot of fun. And, you know, now I'm kind of, you know, picking people I kind of really want to do. So, and I do listen to some, you know, like fans and stuff when they say, do a Stevie Nicks book. And so we just did one of those. So I think that was the last one that just came out. So it's been, okay. and they're fun. I mean, they're fun. They're, yeah. They're yeah, yeah I, I enjoy them. I actually got your, uh, your Betty White. Um, so yeah, I love it. <laughs> well, some of the celebrities we do actually work with and Betty White was one of the ones that we actually worked with. Um, you know, we donated at the time uh to the la zoo which is she was like a big member of so Mm -hmm. so she signed off on the comic book she liked it and you know when she passed away we added four pages to it and made it into a tribute book so okay which i can show you our newest tribute book that we just announced (laughs) it breaks my heart (laughs) is that uh olivia newton john yeah so we have um so we have that one and then we have this cover too Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is so what these actually are is we're actually testing out the foils so for the comic. So so the printer just sent me all these things. So you know that that actually really makes sense considering uh <laughs> who she was that you yes. know the foil. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Xanadu and all that stuff. Yeah, we have a special Xanadu cover coming too, which was my favorite oh, wow. bad movie of all time. So so, like I mentioned earlier, Tidal Wave was originally uh, kind of attached to Image Comics. What was, uh, I guess, the deciding factor to go out on your own and to... <laughs> so, the, the deciding factor to go out on our own. So, we actually, ironically, and we can get into this too. So, Tidal Wave actually started, the company that it is now, which is still Tidal Wave, actually started off as Tidal Wave and then we transferred to Blue Water and then we can talk about that afterwards. I was gonna bring that up later. <laughs> yeah, so at Image Comics, we were Tidal Wave and I I wanted to grow as a company. And so what we did, our first book that we did was 10th Muse. We did, um, we sent them in a, a proposal to do 10th Muse, a book called Black Tide and the Dolls with Randy Green who just got off of Witchblade. And Mike, Miller was doing Black Tide. So we had like a really great slate. And I wanted to, so then what happened is we were doing really well there. And then they offered us an image introduces, which was a basically a bunch of one shots. And mm-hmm. so we got to be part of that. I think there was like six of them. It was like a mini series. And so Legend of Isis was the first one that we did at Image Introduces. And so then I just, kind of just kind of wanted to keep growing and doing more and we got the rights to Tekken and so we started we did Tekken with them for one issue and then I still wanted to grow and I wanted to be like a baby top cow and we wanted to do Atlas there we have um we had a couple other books that we wanted to do there and they just Jim Valentino was just not the 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 coziest person to be working with and we were getting because we also had the celebrity angle which was rena miro and we were trying to be respectful to image comics and saying hey we're doing a press release we're going to be on entertainment tonight is this okay and i really didn't have to do that and so we did it and so we'd get all this press and jim valentino called us punks at the time and i kind of took offense to it and i was like well we're just trying to be a team with image comics and that's why if you look at um issues five and six of the original 10th Muse series we did a crossover with savage dragon and telos which were Mm -hmm. other image comics because i always wanted to do crossovers and be part of like a big team with image and then um then we actually got called into the office of 
I'll just tell you everything. Okay, it's 20 years ago. Um, you got called into the office at Top Cow because if you know anything about the 10th Muse, which is our main character here, she has mm -hmm. a lightning bolt on her face. And um, Matt Hawkins called me in and said, you know, I just have to say that Velocity has a lightning bolt too. And you're probably going to have to change your book and because it's kind of trademark infringed and all that stuff. And I'm like, really? And I looked at him straight in the face. I'm like, what's Rip Claw? And then he's like, oh, okay. And then he kind of just <laughs> Rip Claw is the Wolverine character. So so that kind of just made him stop. And he's he's been kind and nice ever ever since. He's always been nice to me, actually. Uh, but Jim Valentino just seemed like he just like he just wanted to stamp on everything. So, which I get to a certain extent, you know, we ended up the dolls comic book. If you look at the logo, it's, it's D O L L Z. He made us change it from an S to a Z because he wanted his own stamp on it. You know, legend of ISIS. He goes, just don't call it dark ISIS. And he always had something to say about everything that we did. And granted, he has been in the industry for a long time. And I took a lot of what he had to say to heart and um he was sort of a mentor for a little bit but then as i said he just thought we were punks because we were sending out press releases without getting his approval but we would always um we would always send it to him like within like a week before or whatever because we were also working with a press agent at the time so and if they didn't okay. approve, we sent it out so <laughs> But we wanted them to have quotes and that type of stuff. So, because as I said, we wanted to respect. So we ended up leaving after 10th Muse number 10. And we went to our, what is it? Avatar. So. Okay. That was fun. That was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> <laughs> So Tidal Wave was a year of kind of digital first publishing back in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, this focused mostly on like uh, the Nook and the Kindle and um, other devices like that. How pivotal was that to your success? It actually became super pivotal to us. And you have to remember Comixology was just starting at that time. And we were one of the first people to join Comixology and drive through comics, um, some of the original ones. And, um, you know, I'm always willing to try something new, different. You know, I might not know everything about everything. So I always kind of listen. And when people pitch me things, I'm like, okay, let's try it. If it sticks to the wall, great. And digital comics really did. And at that time, we were, I think we just left. We were leaving Diamond, I think. Or I don't even remember when we left Diamond. But um, we left Diamond and then we just became more about the digital books than we did the print books. And we were doing more print on demand and we were working with Comic Flea Market. Um, and so, yeah, my main drive was mainly doing digital books and then just releasing them as graphic novels or whatever. And as I said, working with Comic Flea Market to have them, if people wanted a print copy, they can get it there. Okay. I guess, what were some of the changes that you've seen in the digital realm since you first started? There's been so many changes in the digital world. There's been, um, there was motion comics for a while. There was like, you could actually like click on things, but now they're pretty, they're pretty back to the way that they were, but it's better quality. So um, I prefer reading digital personally as a reader, not, and even for books, um, it's easier for me to read a novel on a Kindle or a Nook than it is for me to read a paper book. I was a reluctant reader as a kid. So I always looked at a book, truthfully, really scary, you know, looking at like a 300 page novel, you're like, oh, that's a lot or whatever it was. Um, and then, then I was just like, as I said, once the digital world w came in, I, I really kind of embraced it, not just for the company, but for myself. And I was like reading books like Gone with the Wind and my reading skills really improved. I was just, as I said, I was a reluctant reader and, you know, I, I think Kindle and Nooks are such a great, uh, or iPads too, are such a great tool for kids to read on. You know, there's there, my, one of my favorite um, platforms that we're on is called Epic. 
and it's um, it's basically mainly for kids and kids books. And so we have a lot of our titles, the more the juvenile titles on those mm -hmm. and they're time to read. So like they, they can't just go through a book. They're actually timed. They go, go back and read some more. And uh, you get like point and, you, and then there's like quizzes at the end. So it's really super interactive. And I find it so great as a tool for kids. I love it. So what are some of the drawbacks that you've actually seen with digital comics? Well, I do think it's a collector's. I think comic books was a collector's market. Um, I think maybe it didn't start out to be a collector's market back in the day, like when Superman first came around. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. in, like whatever it was in 1938, it wasn't a collector's market, but then it became a collector's market. But I think we're getting back to the point where it's not a collector's market. So, but I do like collecting. Um, so it's, I think the digital comic book world does take away kind of from that. And, you know, so yeah, it's, 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 that's a hard one. So, all right. So I wanted to get back to kind of the that name change that you mentioned earlier um you started out as tidal wave and then in i have it written down here uh you went to stormfront media no we went we were uh, we were um we were blue water oh yeah sorry blue water and yeah. then stormfront and then later that year was it went to storm entertainment um and then 2016 uh you went back to tidal wave how have you managed to keep your your audience and um just essentially keep those books going with all that rebranding good question so i mean honestly and once again i'm super blunt super honest about all this stuff um is that we when i did tidal wave i did it with a partner and uh he was one of my good friends and then I just started getting, so then afterwards we went to Avatar and Avatar, we printed, I think three books through, I think we did Odyssey number one, we did, and they were, they were good at the very beginning because they were going to give us like our own imprint. They were being really nice. But then when I saw the actual quality of the books come back, they were just like really, they're just horrible. And then um, and to be even more honest, you know, the guy that ran the company. Um, and you can also put dots to all this if you actually really do this. And uh, this is in me talking out of school, but um, but it's 20 years, so who cares? Um, <laughs> since I'm not writing my own biography, I'll just tell it here. So, uh, so Avatar, the books look bad. And then, you know, the book's numbers were pretty okay, but we weren't getting money. We weren't getting paid for anything. And so, mm -hmm we learned that he was like doubling fees and all this stuff for um, ads and diamond, all that type of stuff. So I just got pretty pissed and I was just like, I'm done. So I left and I think we went to alias and alias was actually a great ride. It was with Mike S Miller, who, as I said, did uh, black tide with us and he does injustice uh, for DC and he did mm -hmm. game of thrones and all this stuff. And we were there for a while. And then, um, that's where we started doing like Victoria. And then that's when we changed to Blue Water. I said, no, did we change to Blue Water then? I don't know. So long ago. No. Um, so actually, so, okay. No, I got it. Okay. So with Avatar, I quit. I ended up quitting comic books. I said, I'm done. Totally done. I can't do this anymore because it started becoming toxic and it started becoming like all this junior high stuff. And that's when I had like a totally thin skin and people were just like, writing the like horrible stuff about us. And then if you look at, and this is where I'm saying, you can kind of connect the dots. And this is where all like the bleeding cool, like negativity campaign came out about us. And so this is connecting the dots is, do you know who owns, uh, do you know who owns bleeding cool? I don't anymore. Avatar. Oh. So I burned Avatar by leaving them. So now they're writing nasty things about me. So put two and two together. So I quit comic books. I was done. I didn't have, as I said, I didn't have a thick skin anymore and I was just so done. And then a friend of mine, Debbie Bishop, who was doing um, Black Tide was going to start her own thing called Angel Gate. And I'm like, okay, I'll do one book there. So I did 10th Muse, um, a one shot on 10th Muse. And then I'm like, then I kind of was thinking, 
and then as i said we went to we went to alias for a while and alias was a really good experience um i really liked them and that's when we became blue water when we went to alias because i was thinking to myself you know i kind of want to still do comics again i had i still had stories to tell so i ended up uh as i said we tried to do with alias we did we launched like seven books seven different titles with them victoria's secret service yeah. your legacy uh judo girl originated atlas and it was it was a very good experience there but they ended up folding and then i just then at that point i was by myself my partner was no longer with me who was doing tidal wave so i thought you know what why don't um i self-publish and the 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 name the how Blue Water came is I was in a restaurant with my mom in Vancouver, BC, and we ended up um, we're at a restaurant called Blue Water, and it just felt right. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to call this company Blue Water. And ever since then, it was Blue Water. And then self public, I was because I also was working with um, Avatar, not Avatar, uh, Arcana. Arcana Press. Mm -hmm. so I did Power of the Valkyrie through, and I really liked Sean a lot. I thought he's a great guy, and so, but I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket anymore. So I'm like, I'm just going to self-publish, and so I self-published, and it worked well for twelve some odd years. So, and then what happened? What? Oh, then somebody came to me with about Blue Water, um, because we were starting to do TV stuff. And we weren't able to use the word blue water in anything TV related. So I thought, okay, I have to change it quick. So let's just change it to, I had a, um, what people kind of maybe don't know is I, I was actually going to be one of the founding fathers of IDW. And um, because I was working, IDW basically started off with people from Wildstorm and people from Todd McFarlane's company. And so they formed a company together and I was, part of them. And so I was going to be part of it. And then I just decided to be the rep. And so at the point, they weren't really publishing stuff. They were doing, you know, custom stuff, which is what I was doing at Wildstorm when I worked there. And so um, I ended up just being the rep, getting them jobs outside of comic books. You know, they were doing what I, I did, you know, at, at Wildstorm. And mm -hmm. So then I formed a company with Alex Sinclair, who was working for DC, who's Jim Lee's colorist. And so he was doing DVD menus for us and, or for me and formed the Stormfront Entertainment Company. And that was like 90, I formed Stormfront Entertainment, I think in like, because it was my own company and I formed it in, oh God, I want to say it was like 98, 99. So it was just this random, you know, company that I had that I would just do for tax purposes. I would do all my custom stuff through there because then I became like the rep for all the top people in the industry, like Joe Matarera and all this stuff. So I, I needed a company for that that was separate from the comic book stuff that I was doing. So going back to the Blue Water thing, when I had to change names, I'm like, oh, I have a name for... I already have this IP already set up, all this stuff. Let's just call it Stormfront Entertainment. And then the kickbacks came and they're like, this is a white supremacist group. <laughs> so, and if you look at what Stormfront Entertainment or Stormfront uh, or .org is on the internet, it is a white supremacist group. So, and then I tried like spinning that one going, oh God, what about Stormtroopers? You know, those are not, and then I'm just like, oh, I can't win. So I'm like, and I was like, Clearly, it was a mistake. Stormfront Entertainment that I had was formed before the Nazi group. And I was called a Nazi and all this. It was like Bleeding Cool just went with it. And like, I was called a Nazi. Yeah, I, I never understood that because, I mean. Because I'm Jewish? <laughs> and I'm like, you're I'm like, like the farthest, you know, from that group I've ever seen. It was before that group. And people didn't realize that that group had nothing to do with essentially comics and or oh you God. or you know there was no affiliation whatsoever just no and, and stance of name right and they just spun it so then i thought to myself 
And at this point, I was just, I started getting burnt out again on everything. And uh, I just got out of a relationship uh, that I was with in for 11 years. You know, he kind of screwed up some things in the company. I was getting super burnt out. I just didn't know what I kind of wanted to do. So then I'm just like, I'll just do Stormfront Entertainment. Fine, let's just do this. And then um, I really wasn't, if you look at that, there's like a block of comics that I did during that time. You could see, honestly, that I just was not super excited about them. And, you know, it just kind of went. And then I caved in and changed it from Stormfront Entertainment to Storm. And then I was just super depressed with that name too, because, you know, it's so hard to Google Storm comics because then you get all the X-Men Storm. Mm-hmm. So, so that just became even more depressing for me to do. And you could see the, the qual- literally the quality of comics that I was doing, the, the titles that I was doing, just not excited about anything. And um, I was mainly, yeah, it, it just was just like, whatever. So that's when I thought, what name excited me back in the time? And Tidal Wave excited me. And so... And I liked it, so I just rebranded the original Tidal Wave comics, which we did at Image Comics. So, there's your okay. whole circle. <laughs> so, I guess one of the big questions that uh, I have from that is, um, how do you as a creator keep from getting burnt out nowadays? You know, to be honest, I was burnt out up until the start of COVID. And I was doing books, once again, that I was just not super excited about. I was just, I'd just do anything to get a book out. You know, there was a mini, and you can, as I said, you can see it in the quality of my work. And um, then COVID hit and I'm like, okay, I I need to be creative. And And my brother was like pushing me. He's like, you need to create a new character. You need to do something new, do something, you know, create something new. And so back as i said two years ago with covid i the tiger king came up or we no, yeah tiger king no not tiger king stormy daniels came up and um doing a stormy daniels biography and so we're like let's do it so we ended up doing that and then the tiger king happened and then i kind of got excited about that cuz everybody was nobody nobody was talking about anything besides covid and tiger king and so i'm like <laughs> let's do uh, a Tiger King biography and Joe Paradise and Michael Frizzell, you know, and I put this together and it became fun again. And working with these guys, seriously, is so much fun. And then we're like, you know what, let's do, uh, then, then Stormy Daniels came back to us and wanted to work with us because she had a bad experience with us when we did the biography comic on her because we didn't get our rights. And then she, her people threatened me and it became this like super bad experience for me. And it was super scary because I knew that she was super litigious. And if you don't know who Michael Avenatti is, you can Google him. He was Stormy Daniels lawyer that she just won a case on against him for stealing money from his books and all this stuff. And um, so he was calling me and I was stressing out and it was just like, ah, and then, um, so I, she contacted me again and her person contacted me that threatened me <laughs> basically and said, you know, Stormy wants to work with you now. He, she really liked what you did and you weren't taking advantage of her. And I'm like, okay. So um, <laughs> I'm like, okay. And so we redid the biography comic book with her and she actually edited it. And then we added some new stuff into it. And then I, then I'm like, I don't want to be done working with you. So then we ended up creating, you know, Space Force with Stormy Daniels, which became like so much fun to create and put together with her, with Michael Frizzell. And so once again, I got super excited about creating something again. Now okay. we're now we're here. <laughs> now we're 10 issues into Stormy Daniels Space Force. So a lot of companies have been relying on uh, that crowdfunding with uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Uh, You've managed to stay away from that and Mm -hmm. still managed to be extremely successful. What's the trick there? I, the trick is (laughs) 
I I got into the Indiegogo as it just first started, or the Kickstarter when it first started. I did my first one. It totally failed. I thought it was a shoe win. We had a best-selling New York Times novelist, YA novelist, whose book was like phenomenal. Um, we had a great artist. We had a great writer. We had everything there, but it tanked. So, and um, I think it tanked for a couple reasons. I think one, it was a YA novel that was turned into a, uh, it was a manga or anime comic book. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem there is that we our marketing was to like 14 year old girls and they don't have money. So they're not going to buy this thing. So that's where part of the problem was. And then, then I just thought, and this is right when it was like first, uh, like, as I said, Kickstarter was just a brand new thing. So it wasn't like things were getting funded really quick. And then I thought my friends should fund it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, so I contacted all my friends and on Facebook and I was going nuts and nuts and posting and posting and posting. And um, I was working with Josh Blaylock from Devil's Do. He was helping me with it. And we were both surprised that it failed. But then we ended up doing an Indiegogo, which still failed, but we ended up doing the book. It was called The Iron King by Julie Kagua. And okay. it came out, did a five, sold and... <laughs> so I decided to never do one again because it was super stressful and I hated it. So... All right. Is, is, do you remember when you were a kid and you either had to sell wrapping paper or you had to sell, you know, candy bars door to door before your parents oh. would do it for you? Yeah, I remember those days. That's what I Kickstarter is for me. <laughs> That's exactly what it was for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you faced a lot of adversity from both media groups and political parties. Um, how has this affected Tidal Wave? And I guess, is it true that there's no such thing as bad press? No, there's such thing as bad press. You know, once again, if because I don't, I, I do still, I do think I'm still sensitive. I think, you know, me being a cancer, you know, has me being sensitive. I, I, I just think, you know, that's sort of my nature. And when somebody writes something bad about me or the company or anything like that, I do take... I, my first thing is to go on the attack and go after it. Um, I don't do it anymore. I just think it's, um, I think it's, it's, it, it, the world has changed so much like with Twitter and all the social media that people can say anything they want without repercussions. And I just have to, you know, there's going to be another cycle like the next day if I don't respond or if I, you know, if it's something that I did wrong, I will own it and I will totally own it. And I'll either do some sort of an interview, you know, like with all the bleeding cool stuff, you know, I didn't want to do an interview with them and I have done stuff with them before. Um, so I went to MTV who at the time had their own website and, you know, I said exactly what it is. So I'm not, I don't hide away from things, but I'm also not gonna shine big lights on them either. So, you know, People, I've gotten death threats. I've gotten, you know, you, emails. Yeah, I've gotten, gotten death threats over all this? Yeah, with an S. <laughs> That's threats. Yeah, I've been. Oh, I've gotten death threats, so. I especially, didn't realize it had gotten that far. Yeah, especially with the political stuff. You know, um, it, like somebody changed my uh, Wikipedia. So when we did a Justin Trudeau comic book, and I honest to God, and this is me maybe being super naive, I'm not a super political person. You know, I vote, I, I do know the basics of it all, but you know, I'm not gonna be on Facebook or Twitter going, ah, this president or this whatever, Congress person, whatever. So I just do the comic books. We literally, with the political ones, I keep them super unbiased. You know, we do a Donald mm -hmm. Trump, we'll do Joe Biden, you know, we'll do, you know, we did. Yeah, you, were, you had both sides of the aisle right there. Always, always. And um, so we did a Justin Trudeau comic book. And because I'm not super political, I did not realize that he is polarizing as Trump was in the United States. So and so it, it went viral in the press about this comic book. And then people just went on Twitter and just like 
raked me over the coals. And this one I didn't take super personally until they changed my Wikipedia page to basically say that I am, I'm gay, which I am, and married, which I am, to my 12-year-old husband, and then I'm a pedophile. And I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so somebody took the time to change my Wikipedia page and basically made me into a pedophile. And wow. I, because somebody told me, he's like, you should check your, you should check your thing here. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I checked it. I'm like, oh my God. And part of it felt like a badge of like, wow, somebody took the time to like screw with me. And we found out who the IP was or where the IP was and it was in Canada. So we do know it was around the time when the Trudeau comic was out and somebody took the time to rake me over the coals. So, but then... Sometimes it is fun, you know, and I think the Justin Trudeau comic book came out during COVID time and we had nothing else to do but drink outside. And so we would drink and we would respond to all the comments like and we would get into so many fights with people and I did not care at that point. So so that's that's good press, bad press. Um, I do think like when Bleeding Cool went after me um, the first time it was bad press because people do tend to believe that people did think I don't pay people, you know, people think that I did not have contracts with people that, you know, if somebody worked on a Vincent Price comic book and we were doing a back end deal with them, they're an adult. They signed this contract. I ask everybody in advance, um, do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Do you have any of this? And if people are not asking the questions, I, I'm not, I, I don't have the answers for them, you know, so that raked the, the, the bleeding cool stuff actually really hurt and hurt my company. People didn't trust my company anymore. People were losing faith in us and all that type of stuff. And there's like a couple artists that went on a tangent on me and all that stuff. And I, it was just easier not to fight back. So now, mm -hmm. um, when you say those artists went on a tangent, are these artists that you've actually worked with or? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, man. they they got on their soapbox and they um, there's one I won't give a name. Uh, she's not very important, but it was kind of weird. She was I drove her to a convention and then two weeks later she was like leaking stuff to Bleeding Cool. And I was just like super floored. And then literally this is the worst part of the whole then they come back and they want to work with you. And I'm like, what? I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, oh my God. And she did. She totally sent me, hey, can I work on this? And I'm like, no. I'm like, block, 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 block. So, oh my God. And there's been a, quite a few people that have wanted to work with me again. All right. Well, when it comes to staying relevant um, with comics, comics have always had kind of that political... Uh, aspect to them. I mean, even when back in the you know forties and kind of late thirties with uh, Captain America, yeah. Superman used to actually actively go against um, corrupt politicians and stuff like that. How do you, I guess, avoid um, adding politics in your comics, or I guess, can you even add politics in your comics, or is it best left like the? Um, Thanksgiving dinner, don't talk about religion or politics. <laughs> um, I, I try not to really put it in our fiction books. You know, Stormy Daniel Space Force is a different book because it's a, um, it, it kind of is a, and this is that book if anybody knows it, yay. Um, but it is kind of like a spoof of what is sort of going on in the world. And Michael Frizzell, who writes it, you know, is a little more political than I am. I am not somebody that I'm comfortable writing fiction politics into anything because I'm not knowledgeable. You know, I think we did, I think back in the day, we did our, the first trans character, one of the first trans characters in comic books. And, but my publisher at the time was very Christian and did not want that character in there. And we also did an HIV book and so that stuff, I'm more, you know, being part of the LGBTQIA community, 
I am more knowledgeable about that. So I can do, you know, an HIV book or I can do something with a trans character or a, a, a gay character or anything like that. Um, but when it comes to politics, yeah, I'm not, it, it's, it's right what you know, I guess is a thing. So, but like with the political power, which is the nonfiction stuff, of course, I, I, there's some people I absolutely will not do as a comic book, you know, the, the, the crazier side of things, I, I kind of try to stay away from, you know, I, and I know you're probably going to go here, but um, we got boycotted by Fox or they, um, they, they said we were snubbing Melania Trump and not doing a comic book on her. And my thought process on that is that because they thought, because we just released a Jill Biden comic book. And so at that point, you know, we did Hillary Clinton in the past. We've done Michelle Obama. We did uh, Nancy Reagan. And I'm trying to think who else we did. Uh, I think I, I think that might be it for the first ladies. So we never really did a first lady series. We just did a female four series. And with Melania Trump, there was just not enough meat in the story to tell like a full 22 page thing without people telling me, and this went all through the internet too, tell me why we should do a Melania Trump comic book, but don't tell me she can speak eight languages and she's pretty. So other than that, nobody could come up with anything and you can't fill a comic book with somebody speaking eight languages. So well, it's really only two panels. Honestly, yeah, totally. And that's not a slam or a slight to her. You know, I, I have nothing against her. And um, so, but Fox News ended up, you know, and that was kind of like the good pass, the, the no press is bad or whatever. The, this actually was not that bad but because we fought back on that one. And so we ended up, um, so Fox News got this bone that we were um, only doing, cons uh, not conservative, we were only doing liberal women. And because we've done Kamala Harris, we've done, you know, AOC. And, but what they, and the ironic thing about that is there was five shows on Fox News that was, that was talking about this. And one of them was Laura Ingram. And we did a comic book on Laura Ingram that they showed during the time. So it's like, you're saying we're not doing conservative women, but you are a conservative woman. You know, we've done Michelle Bachman, we've done, so we try to keep both sides of the fence. We just did Amy Coney Barrett. So they spun this so weirdly. And then one of my really good friends who used to work for the LA Times, we wrote a thing back to them and they ended up having to apologize. Fox News apologized on air to us. So, okay. and then they did the whatever and whatever. Next, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love, it was so great, so. All right, so I guess moving away from uh, the political stuff, um, in terms of keeping both your company and comics mm. in general relevant, how do you pick your next projects? I think, so for especially the biography things, one thing that I think I do have a skill set in is knowing trends, what's going to be hot, what's going to be not, and trying to stay away from people that are only going to be in the media or like for two minutes, you know, like the, the flash in the pan. Yeah. And yeah. so I've kind of tried to stay away from like, you know, the reality stars. I've tried to, you know, a good example would be like, we did Victoria justice. Do you know who she is? Nope. Not exactly. <laughs> That's why we won't do another one like that. She was a, um, I think she was an either, I think she was a Nickelodeon. She, she did a show called victorious and she had like an album and she was like a Ariana Grande kind of person or a Demi Lovato okay. kind of person. But she was kind of like almost on that one hit wonder kind of thing. And I'll, uh -huh. I'll, I try to stay away from, you know, until somebody is a little bit bigger. So, and so like, you know, Dolly Parton is probably one of the biggest selling comic books we've had since, you know, for a long time. And, um, so we did a second Dolly Parton. And so I'm kind of looking at people like that, people like a Stevie Nicks, people that have mm -hmm. that sort of super built-in fan base already, you know, as you can kind of see over my shoulder, one that we haven't announced yet. So, <laughs> so, 
So people that have the built-in fan bases, all that type of stuff are people that I kind of want to uh, stick with. You know, doing bands, you know, Metallica is a, a big seller for us. So I do want to do people like, you know, Rush, I think would be a great band to do a comic book on. So. Okay. Uh, you, last time we had talked, I think you were working on a Michelle Nichols book. Yeah, you know, we're still doing that. Yeah, that's still in the process. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I do. Has, has that affected, like, has that changed, I guess, since uh, her passing? It will be a tribute comic book and it'll show okay. me kissing her in the comic book. Yeah, I remember seeing that on Facebook. I was like, oh, you know, Michelle Nichols, that's so cool. <sighs> Wait, <sighs> hold on, sorry. <clears throat> we made out. Ah, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> so, with uh, the new. I guess, series of 10th Muse coming out. Um, how do you kind of plan to follow that one? Uh, we are calling it New Beginnings. So it is going to, we have a series now, which is probably one of my favorite series that I've done in a long time called B The Bold and the Brave. And I love that one. <laughs> so Bold and the Brave, is, this is issue number one. And mm -hmm. every single, every single comic book has an homage to the Brave and the Bold series with Batman back in the day um, from the 70s and 80s. And so this is like the one with Wonder Woman, that type of stuff. But we've done so many of them. I think this is like Judo Girl being Karate Kid, Blackbeard Legacy. Here's some ones that are super coming up. You know, the Shazam. Oh, that's a different book. But uh, this one's coming out soon. And we have this is the next one with Valkyrie and it's, it's a team up with 10th Muse and somebody else. And the art is phenomenal. I have about, I think five different artists uh, working for us doing different books. I like issue. Let's put it this way. Let's see. So this is a secret one that nobody's seen yet, but if you look at the number on top, which is right there, um, number 10 comes out this week. So literally, I have 25 of these already like in the can, and the art is like fantastic. It is like some of the best stuff we've worked on. You know, I work with this guy named Paulo Monte, and he, like here's number 17. So we have a lot of stuff. So, and that spun off a series called Tidal Wave Comics Presents, which basically mimics the DC Comics Presents covers. And this is the one with, I think, Robin and Elongated Man. So, oh, yeah, okay. So, when you're saying bringing back 10th Muse, so we've been, you know, as I said, the Bold, the Bold and the Brave is, um, is an ongoing series and it's monthly. Mm -hmm. And so, the 10th Muse is going to be monthly as well. And we're bringing her to new ground. We're moving her from San Francisco to New York. Um, I'm actually writing again for the first time. I'm working with Michael Frizzell. I keep mentioning over and over. He's a brilliant writer. Uh, so he's co-writing it with me. So it's been super fun to do that. And just keeping her relevant, you know, and kind of making the comic what it once was. So the art is once again, amazing in the book. So, so I'm super proud of that one. Too. So what is it uh, to you that uh, I guess keeps her so close to your heart? Well, first of all, she's named after my niece, Emma. So Emma Sonnet is that. All my family members, my mom who passed away, she's one of the characters in it, my nephew, Brett. Um, I think it was my first creation I ever did. And um, she's now on wine labels. But, um, but seriously, um, I think she's like my first child. So, you know, it's my first love. You know, it's my first thing that I ever did. And luckily it was super successful. You know, I was pretty lucky. I hit it at the right time. You know, all the top cow stuff was super popular back then. We kind of mimicked just how they do stuff, like super polished artwork with really good writing and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we checked everything and I, we're going to do that again with this as well. So where can people actually go to find all this? We do sell mostly through Amazon. And um, we are with Ingram, which is one of our distributors. Uh, comic book stores can get us. We are still 10 years with Comic Flea Market. So we still do exclusive covers and that type of stuff with them. Um, 
So yeah, it's, Ten Fiends number one will be out 22 years after her release to the month, which is usually wow. November. So okay, all right. Um, well, I guess that's everything that I have. Like I said, everybody, like, share, subscribe, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I thank really appreciate having it. Me. I appreciate you guys so much. So, oh, we love having you. It's awesome. <laughs> I love your I love your Emma Frost picture in the back. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, <laughs> that's like the classic. Because got... Randy Green did the interior art to that book. Really? Uh huh. Like... Yeah, I met uh, Greg at uh, a convention in Salt Lake, and we sat down. We were top, talking for probably two, maybe three hours, and. He's a great guy. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> really, really great guy. So. It sounds good. Matt, what happened to your, your hand? Masturbation Electric accident. Scooter accident. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> no, it was an electric scooter accident. So. God, you're one of those. You know. Uh, I drive a Jeep Grand Cherokee with a V8, so when the price of gas jumped up, I, I had to do Still something it. else. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's fair. Is it a cool Raider, Razor scooter? No, it's it's actually a little bit more powerful. So. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> ah, just, just like a good <laughs> crypto comics. <laughs> <laughs> What? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm getting water. my booze ready. Well, it's terrible. never a Darren thing without drinking. Jesus Christ. Exactly. I guess not at this point. I mean, <laughs> this is going in a blooper reel. You know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you've managed to face a lot of adversary. I uh, can't even talk. Let me regain my thoughts. And I'll take a sip to this one because I sure I'm going to need it. <laughs> uh. <laughs>